<coughs> well, thank you very much, Bruce, for your kind words. I'm delighted to be here again. Um, and um, I do hope um, that there might be some stimulating discussion afterwards. I'm looking forward. Uh, hopefully, uh, possible interaction will develop. So I would like to talk about um, um, a another pigment, which is in the retinal pigment epithelium lipofuscin. It's the age pigment. Uh, I will mention about melanin, but uh, this is not the primary uh, topic of my, uh, of my uh, presentation here. So the brief outline of the talk is the oxidative stress and retina degeneration, photoreactivity of the age pigment in model systems, and then phototoxicity in cells in vitro, and possible for, for the protection by melanin, and then about this photodynamic stress, sublethal, I think that's critical because lethal, I mean, it's not interesting uh, if you, you can kill cells with many um, different methods, including photodynamic stress. But when sublethal photodynamic stress is present, it can lead to severe dysfunctions. Uh, the cells still survive, but uh, they don't function as they're supposed to. So we actually tested this by looking at the inhibition of organelle motility, inhibition of specific photoreceptor outer segments, phagocytosis by uh, ARP19 cells. Those are cells that can be cultured in vitro. And then uh, last, the effect of sublethal photodynamic stress on nanomechanical properties of ARP19 cells. It's something uh, new. Uh, we just acquired a beautiful piece of equipment, atomic cross microscopy, and I hope it will be as productive as it promises to be. <clears throat> so uh, chronic oxi oxidative stress in the outer retina uh, and photoreactivity of these cells. Chronic oxidative stress in retinal pigment epithelium is viewed as a contributing factor to the pathogenesis of age-related macular degeneration. There is no doubt that the disease, uh, which is the uh, major cause of blindness in people over 60 in developed countries is a multifactorial disease, meaning there are many factors involved, including genetic factors. But in my talk, I'd like to stress, I'd like to emphasize the role of oxidative stress. Now, exposure to intense visible light from focal irradiation, high oxygen tension, and accumulation of the H pigment lipofuscin can increase the risk of oxidative stress in RP, that's the main point I would like to make. Oxidative stress could result from sublethal photosensitized oxidation reaction mediated by lipofuscin. So lipofuscin acts here, this is an endogenous pigment, acts here as a photosensitizing dye. Well, of course, it's a complex system. It's not just a one molecule. Well, lipofuscin isolated from human RPE cells exhibits substantial photoreactivity and phototoxicity after being induced to culture cell by phagocytosis. And I will try to briefly uh, you know, sort of, uh, illustrate this. So this is, of course, the cross-section of the human retina, actually the outer segment, outer part of the retina. So the choroid here is the retinal pigment epithelium. It's just a single cell layer uh, in close proximity with photoreceptor outer segments. Um, the the R RPE plays a very important role because it supports the photoreceptor cells and the entire retina and is involved in some critical metabolism of retinoids, uh, which is important for renewal of outer segments, of photoreceptor outer segments. Without uh, efficient phagocytosis, then this renewal process, uh, retina would very quickly degenerate, and that it's known in special type of rats, the Royal College of Surgeon Rats. <coughs> Uh, it is at high risk of oxidative stress, including photic stress, because of the location and the function and some other things that perform. But, but here, it's a, it's a flat mount of uh, human retina pigment epithelium uh, taken from uh, post-mortem eye. And you can see here, well, that's actually a fluorescence of lipofuscin. You see a huge heterogeneity between the cells, and, and that's another important factor. Not all cells behave the same. Single cells may behave very differently, and I, again, I will stress this later in my talk. So what's known about the fo aerobic photoreactivity and photoxicity of lipofuscin? In model systems, irradiation of isolated lipofuscin granules with blue light induced formation of singlet oxygen, superoxide, and hydrogen peroxide, 
leading to oxidation of unsaturated lipids and inhibition of enzymes. Lipofuscin granules experimentally introduced into cultured RPE cells followed by irradiation produce outcomes such as extraglanular oxidation of lipids, inactivation of lysosomal antioxidant enzymes, loss of lysosomal integrity, and cell death. Uh, so this was the basis of a formulation of a hypothesis, still hypothesis, of course, uh, about the role of lipofuscin, this endogenous photosensitizer that accumulates with age in retina pigment epithelium. So high level of lipofuscin, light and oxygen would lead to reactive oxygen species, and if a threshold is exceeded, oxidative stress would result leading to critical changes uh, that would eventually contribute to age-related macular degeneration. So here is how we uh, isolate lipofuscin. It's a homogenate of retinal pigment epithelium cells uh, on the top of a, 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 a sucrose gradient, discontinuous sucrose gradient. And after ultra-centrifugation, you see different layers. That's the lipofuscin. So we can take, purify, and we have nice population lipofuscin granules. The only problem at the moment is that the access to uh, human eyes is very limited. <clears throat> so that's some old data. But this shows the um, photoreactivity of a chloroform extract uh, of lipofuscin. So this is, uh, these are those photosensitized uh, components of lipofuscin uh, isolated by this uh, fault extraction. And you can see here, this is a direct uh, singlet oxygen measurement because it's at 1,270 nanometers phosphorescence. So when excited with, um, well, here it was actually 355 nanometers, um, there is this phosphorescence. And uh, you see that, well, this, for instance, shows that this is without uh, oxygen. So obviously, it's oxygen dependent. And there are some other uh, controls. Now, if you take if this, uh, well, sort of extrapolate to zero time, uh, you can plot uh, this sort of spectrum, action spectrum of lipofuscin granules, well, the extract of lipofuscin granules. You can see that, obviously, the photoreactivity here shown as the formation of singlet oxygen very strongly depends on wavelength and, of course, increases significantly in blue part of the spectrum, which is consistent with this idea that blue, the short wavelength visible light could contribute to this uh, uh, degeneration of uh, retinal pigment epithelium. Here is another um, technique that we use. It's, uh, of course, uh, the electron paramagnetic resonance spin trapping. Uh, so DMPO is a spin trap. It, well, here in the presence, now it's excitation of lipofuscin granules with blue light. And this is control dark, then after irradiation, a signal develops. It's a spin adduct without going into details. It can very convincingly be uh, determined as uh, the DMPO OOH um, um, spin adduct due to the spin trapping of superoxide and ion and protonization of this. And here actually showed some data indicating that with H, uh, the photoreactivity of lipofuscin actually increases. Now, we, w we got some new system, a beautiful system. Uh, it's a one kilohertz uh, neodymium uh, YAG laser with OPO. Now we can actually excite uh, very specifically between 2020 and 1400 nanometers. So it, well, like, look, let's look at it and see whether we can actually observe formation of singlet oxygen if we have suspension of granules, not extract. Extract is easy. But how about suspension of lipofuscin granule? Well, this is actually in D2O. Well, signals are not uh, very impressive, as you can see, for two reasons. First of all, uh, we, we only excited this for like five, 10 seconds. Of course, the accumulation, well, in principle, if it's longer, would be better. Unfortunately, there was a significant bleaching of lipofuscin granules, so uh, can't, can't do too much. Uh, but, but, but the data here are convincing, again, because look, this is at 1,355 nanometers, and this is at 1,270 nanometers, where the singlet oxygen actually has this specific, well, sort of specific phosphorescence. And here it shows that, obviously, it's dependent on oxygen, because this is in nitrogen, this is in the presence of air. So we are quite confident that, yes, we can detect singlet oxygen in, well, 
native, whatever you call it, uh, Lipofuscin granules. So, in having all the background and the information, we can propose some very sim simplistic, of course, type of interaction that occur. So, upon uh, excitation, of course, you have formed you form the singlet excited state of some critical chromophores. Well, that's the problem. We're still not quite sure what exactly are the chromophores. So the molecular nature of those chromophores, it's not actually resolved. I mean, we have some idea, but uh, anyway. So the singlet uh, excited state, of course, it would, you know, this relaxation would go to fluorescence or heat. We can detect both. Uh, then, of course, intersystem crossing would generate triplet excited state critical for formation of singlet oxygen due to this energy transfer. Um, and, and we also know now, because we observe a significant oxygen consumption, that this type of process probably also occurs. So either direction, interaction be between the triplet excited states and, uh, and oxygen at the ground state, or lipofuscin in the ground state and singlet oxygen lead to uh, formation of superoxide and ion and some other things which can be then spin-trapped, as shown here. Um, and of course, uh, singlet oxygen can be detected, as shown here. Now, all those so-called reactive oxygen species that are generated uh, could lead to um, Lipofuskin-dependent oxidation, which, uh, if it's uh, too big, could uh, induce significant cell damage, or damage to important cellular components. Here are some data we, we just uh, uh, obtained, um, and um, well, the uh, manuscript has been just accepted uh, for publication. It's a confluent culture of human RPE cells, so it's from so it's primary culture, uh, containing endogenous lipofuscin. I mentioned that in the paper published some time ago, collaboration with um, Mike Bolton from Britain, we were able to show that uh, after phagocytosis, we observe phototoxicity. But how about endogenous lipofuscin without this? Well, we can act actually uh, observe pretty much the same. Uh, here are the data. So uh, this is fluorescent uh, micrograph rep of representative culture. You see that these and these show significant fluorescence, again, uh, due to the fact that those RPE cells contain higher amount of lipofuscin granules, endogenous lipofuscin granules. Other cells uh, might be shown here, contain less uh, lipofuscin granules. But, but we can uh, observe uh, the dependence of those different cells uh, as a function of the amount of lipofuscin granules. Here, it's uh, just a percentage of the area uh, that indicates this characteristic fluorescence. So uh, you can see, and, and, and the, um, the uh, lethal effects af upon after exposure to blue light can be observed by, well, for instance, nuclear uh, propidium iodide staining that, you know, after cell is uh, critically damaged, uh, this uh, fluorescence develops. As you can see here, uh, the cells are, of course, dead. So uh, you can see here that after a relatively short irradiation, after hours, this uh, propidium iodide fluorescence develops, and you can see that uh, the process starts faster or much uh, later, uh, depending on the amount of lipofuscin granules that those cells contain. Well, obviously, uh, there is a clear dependence of the phototoxic effect on presence of lipofuscin granules. Now, here, uh, there is this additional uh, pigment, uh, melanin, because RPE cells, of course, contain not only lipofuscin granules, they contain, first of all, melanosomes, melanin granules. Now, in this particular case, because we wanted to modify the amount of melanin granules, it would be very difficult to find uh, uh, you know, RPE cells with the desired number of lipofuscin granules and melanosomes, so you have to compromise some of it. So we just uh, allowed the cells to contain whatever they contain, endogenous lipofuscin granules, and increase the number of melan melan melanin granules by phagocytosis. So after that, you can see, uh, well, here are some. Uh, but the important thing is this, of course, picture showing that at low melanosome concentration, again, uh, the outcome is different. The, in the um, beginning of this process, 
uh, uh, reduction in the cell survival is faster than when uh, cells contain higher number of melanin granules. Again, uh, rather convincingly showing that we have a protective effect of melanin against this phototoxic effect of lipofuscin. screen. Now, is it simply screening? Well, not exactly. Uh, because, uh, well, here we use actually black latex beads as controlled granules and can also be introduced into cells by phagocytosis. <clears throat> and we can have a higher, lower number of those beads uh, and they actually shown here. Uh, but, but, but the important thing is that high number of black latex beads did not change much. I mean, the outcomes, the phototoxicity dependent on lipofuscin, actually it's not very much different. Whether the cells contain those uh, high number of latex beads or not. So that should account for some optical screening. So, <clears throat> so the role of pigment granules in lethal photostress to RP cells, a greater susceptibility to lethal light exposure of cells containing greater amount of autofluorescent lipofuscin as compared to those with few granules indicates that phototoxicity mediated by lipofuscin is cell autonomous and related to the content in individual cells rather than producing cell death equivalent through, throughout the monolayer. So that, that's one important implication, so ob observation. Uh, the effects are cell autonomous. They, individual cells will react differently. Well, but th this was lethal effect. No, it's not, uh, not, that's not my, <laughs> what I want to talk about because we wanted to actually observe sublethal effects. So, well, what can we do? And um, so it's just basic ideas that, of course, different uh, reactive oxygen species would have different radius of action depending on their reactivity. That's quite simple. Of course, hydroxyl radicals would be would have very short radius of interaction. Well, they are extremely reacted. They would interact with anything. Uh, singlet oxygen is perhaps a little, it's definitely more specific. Still, the radius of interaction, it's relatively small. Uh, and of course, superoxide and ion, that's much more, uh, much less reactive. So that could, act, could actually diffuse and interact with something. So, but, but if we are interested in local effects, well, how about if we, these are, of course, uh, melanosomes here yeah, shown. How about loading melanosomes with a photosensitizer? And, um, but you have to remember that that has been shown long time ago. If you have a photosensitizer cationic type, which would interact with melanosomes like metal ions, the binding would be electrostatic. Uh, the photoreactivity is totally quenched as a result of this interaction with melanin. This is a very powerful uh, protective mechanism by melanin. So we can't use such uh, photosensitizer. But the rose bengal, for instance, it's uh, negatively charged, but it shows uh, affinity. It can stick to almost anything. So we can actually load uh, uh, those melanosomes and then introduce to cells with rose bang and then introduce to cells with phagocytosis and observe the effects, which should be according to this law. Uh, and of course, uh, one measure is to observe the um, motility of organelles. You can see it's a complex, of course, system. It's, uh, there are many um, components involved according to this uh, nice review. Anyway, uh, what has been shown, and that's several years ago by my colleagues Janice Beck and Marius Zaremba, that sublethal photic stress uh, impairs the motility of melanosomes and phagosomes within cultured RPE cells. Photosensitizer loaded phagosomes exhibited greater motility impairment than those lacking photosensitizer, which supported the interpretation that damaging species were photogenerated locally in the subcellular domain of the organelles slowing down the organelle movement in proportion to their abundance. And here I had some data uh, just um, uh, illustrating this. So this is the movement individual of individual granules and after irradiation, 10 minutes with green light, which excites rose bengal and promotes the formation of reactive oxygen species by this photosensitized reaction. 
you see a significant reduction in motility. Now, how about if we have, um, uh, and here are the outcomes. How about if we have uh, the, if we don't load with uh, Rose Bengal, if we observe motility of lipofuscin granules and then compare to motility of other granules, for instance, melanosomes. Now, obviously, if um, our, well, if the hypothesis, which is basis of the study, is correct, then lipofuscin granules, because it's much more photoreactive than melanosomes, uh, would, should be, should slow down its movement more significantly. Anyway, these are um, uh, endogenous lipofuscin granules. You can see the fluorescence picture. This is a contrast. So uh, if you overlay, so you can observe actually melanosome and single granule of this lipofuscin, and uh, let's see what happens. So here is baseline motility. It's uh, shown by this blue line. Uh, uh, and um, this is during treatment and post-irradiation. You see that obviously there is a significant slowing down of this motility. Now, uh, here is actually uh, the data shown here. This is the treatment. Now, wh what you also see, the black sort of uh, uh, those figures uh, show that the slowdown in the lipofuscin motility depends on the presence of melanin. With higher melanosome granules presence in such cells, the effect is not as um, uh, pronounced. So, the decreased light susceptibility for cells with higher number of melanosomes generated by delivering the pigment granules to culture for phagocytic uptake indicates that the susceptibility of RPE cells to photic injuries is determined N not by their lipofuscin content alone, but is modulated by their coincidental content of melanosomes. It further illustrates the cell autonomy of its susceptibility to photic stress. The photoprotective effect of melanosomes could not be attributed to simple light absorbance, since similar absorbing black particles did not as, uh, simply protect. So. I think it's actually a promising approach because now we can really monitor subliteal effects induced by um, excitation of lipofuscin, uh, this endogenous photosensitizer. Because the slowing down of motility of those granules um, is observed much faster than any lethal effect. The cells seemingly function okay, except that this slowing down is observed. So some of the machinery, of course, is affected by those sublethal phototoxic effects. Well, here is another uh, example of uh, what um, we try to use in our study. It's the phagocytosis. Uh, I already mentioned that one of the key functions of retinal pigment epithelium cells is their phagocytosis of periodically shed, shed photoreceptor outer segments. Now, uh, you can actually observe here this. Uh, so in this particular case, we used uh, labeled with um, fluorescein uh, isotanate. Uh, those are the uh, not reactive oxygen species. They should be post photo, um, photoreceptor um, uh, outer segments. Uh, um, uh, labeled with this fluorescent dye, and you can see that after exposure of retinal pigment epithelium cells to those uh, to, to such a system, you observe uh, this is intracellular fluorescence, uh, and um, uh, indicating that we can actually detect uh, efficient phagocytosis. The cells cultured in vitro, still able to phagocytose those uh, photoreceptor outer segments. Now, after treatment, the cells with um, low concentration of merocyanin 540, it's not a particularly powerful photosensitizer, but it's been used for in a number of studies. Um, the efficiency to uh, take up phagocytose, those labeled so with its uh, photoreceptor outer segments significantly decreased. Well, it can be actually measured uh, by uh, flow cytometry, 
uh, as you can see here, this is control. So this, those are the cells uh, before um, exposing to photoreceptor outer segments labeled with the fluorescent dye. And this is after, uh, you can see, of course, that significant number of cells now become fluorescent. And with treatment, here the treatment is actually with rose bengal at lower concentration, about 800 nano uh, molecule, mono molecule per liter. Uh, you see that, of course, uh, the amount of uh, taken up uh, fluorescent uh, photoreceptor outside the same significantly decrease. So the data shown here, the effect is actually reversible to significant extent. So th the data shown in uh, dark green is uh, after five hours, after uh, photodynamic treatment of the cells. Uh, this is for uh, this is merocyanin 540. This is rose bengal as a function of concentration of the dye at the same doses of light. Uh, and this is after 24 hours. So we are we have definitely sublethal effect. The cells survive. They survive 100%. Now, even the effect that we are trying to detect this efficiency of phagocytosis is only intermediately affected. So the, the, the efficiency goes actually back to normal after 24 hours. But here is uh, non-specific phagocytosis because these are fluorescent beads, not photoreceptor out the same. They will see pretty much the same effect. Well, here are slightly disappointing results. What we wanted to uh, demonstrate uh, was that having, well, that adding to the system, to the cells, antioxidants such as uh, zeaxanthin or alpha tocopherol, those are very known powerful antioxidants, um, we would significantly uh, modify the inhibitory effect of photodynamic action on um, the ability of cell to phagocytose photoreceptor outer segments. Well, well, there is some effect, but not particularly strong, as you can see. So that's disappointing. Disappointing if you look at these data. Oh, I see. Well, what happened? Why is that? Hmm. Well, th this is just, of course, uh, a scheme that shows this type 1, type 2 photosensitized uh, oxidation reaction leading to the formation of singlet oxygen and then direct oxidation uh, formation of hydroperoxide and here via, of course, the um, electron transfer uh, leading to, react to formation of um, uh, free radicals. Well, in this particular case, what we were actually what, what we studied was the formation of cholesterol hydroperoxides. In most cells, at least in uh, mammal cells, cholesterol is always present. It's an important part of membranes. So, um, and, and of course, we, we sort of uh, postulated, uh, hypothesized, that the inhibitory effect of photodynamic action on cells in terms of their ability to phagocytose was somehow related to oxidative modification of their membranes, because membranes are, of course, important and they play a significant role. Now, well, we thought that simply oxidation of those unsaturated fatty acids or phospholipids occur. And, of course, to monitor this, uh, we are actually able to detect formation of specific products. 7-alpha, 7-beta, it's a product dependent on free radical type oxidation, 5-alpha uh, cholesterol hydroperoxide, it's a product related to singlet oxygen interaction, very specific. And, uh, and, and you see here again uh, you know, the formation of, indicating that mostly the singlet oxygen dependent process is responsible for the, that oxidation. And you can see here that the inhibitory effect of uh, antioxidants, if you look at the uh, accumulation of those products, is actually quite pronounced, much more than the effect we observed for phagocytosis. So that, unfortunately, uh, that it's not consistent. Well, we tried, perhaps there are some other factors, and, and of course there are, uh, because phagocytosis is um, controlled by specific receptors in cells. 
So there are proteins, of course, that could also be modified. So in this particular case, we actually wanted to see, well, these are the just the actin, cadherin, and uh, uh, another protein show that, that it's uh, using a, a specific uh, diwican uh, sort of indicators. It's showing that, that those um, proteins responsible for cytoskeleton not significantly modified by the action of our photodynamic treatment. Um, so here is a Western blot analysis showing MERT TK protein in control ARP19 cells and cell preloaded with eight, that should be micromole of course, neurocyanin or 600 nanomole uh, rose van Gaal and analyzed five or half an hour or 24 hours after irradiation. Well, basically the data, maybe if you pay attention here, shows that there is not much happening, at least for this receptor. But fortunately, what we observed, it's another receptor. I guess there are several receptors. Some of them are responsible for binding of those, pho of those membrane or photoreceptor outer segments, and some of are responsible for internalization because the process is quite complex. So here's another receptor. It's a heterodimer AD beta 5. Uh, again, uh, we can observe by the Western blotting. And here we observe a significant uh, reduction of that um, receptor. Now, what's also important, process is reversible. After 24 hours, you see that the level of that, of that receptor responsible for phagocytosis goes back to normal, which is consistent with the data we observed when we detected uh, the activity uh, to phagocytose, uh, the activity of cells to phagocytose, phagocytose after 24 hours, it was pretty much back to normal. So, uh, in a summary, we say that photodynamic treatment reversibly inhibits specific phagocytosis by ARP cells and induces oxidation of membrane lipids. Well, the effects are reduced by natural antioxidant, particularly the oxidation of membrane lipids. Uh, after PD treatment of ARP19 cells, a photoreceptor um, a, a receptor protein abundance and phagocytosis show a coincident and time reduction than recovery, suggesting that diminution in receptor protein contributes to the phagocytic effect which is again encouraging because it shows that we can monitor at least one parameter uh, which is relevant for, for the process we were actually studying. The data imply that phagocytosis receptor in RPE cells are sensitive to oxidative modification, raising the possibility that chronic oxidative stress in C2 may reduce the efficiency of RPE's role in photoreceptor turnover thereby contributing to retinal degeneration. I already indicated that this is an absolutely critical process. Without uh, efficient phagocytosis of photoreceptor outer segments, the entire retina will degenerate quite fast. Actually, the data, and I apologize, <laughs> that's in Polish. I just got it tomorrow, uh, to, to today in the morning, uh, my uh, colleagues in Krakow. Well, it's actually also very uh, sort of promising data. Now, here, we used a um, novel, I think, a way of determining, detecting uh, protein oxidation in cells. Well, actually, in cell lysis, because that's how it's done. Uh, by using coumarin uh, boron acidic acid, this compound. It had been synthesized by colleagues at Medical College of Wisconsin. And, well, initially it was synthesized for determining uh, the uh, presence of peroxynitrite, and it works very well, extremely well. It, uh, the rate cause, well, one thing, obviously it's not 100% specific. There are no specific indicators, you have to remember. And, and of course this isn't. But, but, but for peroxynitrite, for instance, it's like a million times faster than interaction, interacting with hydrogen peroxide, which is already an important issue. But here ROOH indicates protein. Um, hydroperoxide. So, so, so eventually you have this uh, blue fluorescent uh, product and that's the uh, intensity of fluorescence that is observed. So these are controls and here cells containing phagocytized lipofuscin granules. We don't, in this particular case, we didn't have primary human cells. 
So we have to increase the amount because ARP19 cells do not contain any lipofuscin to start with. By phagocytosis, they do. And upon irradiation, this is not the irradiating irradiation time. The cells were irradiated for one hour. So they perfectly survived. Oh, and of course, here, it's just the assay. It takes time to develop this characteristic, well, sort of characteristic fluorescence. It's, it's promising because it shows that we can actually monitor formation of protein hydroperoxides. That's an important target of oxidation um, mediated by lipofuscin generated um, reactive oxygen species. So I'm quite happy to, to show you and hopefully there will be more such data. So um, the last part is just a uh, again, uh, data we very recently obtained. We wanted to see if um, another technique uh, could be used to monitor such sublethal oxidative um, effects in ARP19 cells. So we used atomic force microscopy, imaging, and uh, force spectroscopy. So here, of course, the data. Uh, so this is con these are control say ARP19 cells containing lipofuscin but without uh, irradiation with light. Here, after irradiation, you can see some uh, important changes. Uh, that's uh, in, uh, in their morphology. But the nanomechanical analysis uh, actually shows even more profound changes. So this is a sort of a typical uh, distribution of the Young's module that is determined in different part of the cells. And, um, and it shows sort of typical lock type function, while the photodynamically treated shows more Gaussian. And if you compare the data, it should be obvious that photodynamically treated cells are much softer than those uh, containing, that those that have not been treated. Now, the, the change in nanomechanical properties probably result from modification of the cell cytoskeleton, which is responsible for those nanomechanical properties. Uh, so, uh, so here, of course, we can model such an effect. And of course, those cells contain lipofuscin granules. Uh, but here, we can model uh, using known photosensitizer. And we observe, and we get pretty much the same data. So this is for controlled cells. It's uh, this log distribution and um, much more uh, Gaussian distribution uh, the uh, Young's module uh, for cells that have been uh, mm, photodynamically treated and uh, photosensitized uh, reaction is m mediated by rose bengal or merocyanin. Uh, well, actually, here is, uh, yeah, m m this is merocyanin 540, this is rose bengal. And um, if you look at the morphology of this cells, you know, the stress fibers look differently after such a, uh, such a, um, such a treatment. You can actually, we think, we will, should be able to observe uh, the cells actually survive. So these are live cells. Um, uh, they are uh, actually uh, imaged by atomic force microscopy. So with different time after, uh, during irradiation, um, with, in the presence of those photosensitizers, we, we can uh, uh, observe such remarkable changes. So to uh, sum up, uh, these are, uh, as I said, very new data, and um, we still have to understand what exactly what the changes represent. I, the changes in cytoskeleton is quite, uh, it's, some, uh, it's an obvious conclusion, but again, it would be nice to determine at the molecular level what exactly, what changes. But perhaps uh, combining this uh, new assay for detection of um, oxidation products of proteins and uh, Western blotting determining at much higher sensitivity what exactly, which of those um, proteins that uh, play a role in the cytoskeleton uh, are modified, we could say something uh, more uh, uh, combining with the uh, nanomechanical analysis. So at the end, I um, would like to uh, acknowledge uh, um, contributors. First of all, long-time collaborated from Medical College of Wisconsin, Janice Berg. She uh, was cell biologist and uh, uh, she was associated with the ophthalmology department of Medical College. Marius Alemba, he was my uh, PhD student, then postdoc, and then he ended up in Milwaukee. 
Uh, Chris Kumatz, a very skillful technician. She was very, uh, uh, very uh, important in terms of the uh, measurements. Joy Joseph, he's a chemist, organic chemist, who actually synthesized this probe for detecting uh, um, uh, protein oxidation products. Radoslav Michalski from Luch Technical University, uh, he worked with Joy Joseph, so uh, uh, played an important role. And um, people from my laboratory, uh, Anja Pilat, Magdalena Olhava, and Grzegorz Przeczy, they are postdocs now. They used to be my PhD students. Uh, that they contributed significantly to this project. And of course, I would like to acknowledge uh, financial support. In Milwaukee, it was mostly NIH, NEI, and in Poland, it was a National Science Center, which uh, using the funds, I was able to buy, as I've mentioned, very recently, atomic force microscopy. So thank you for your attention.